and if you want to dress up, great, because, um, you know, really, it's, it's a time, and a lot of, you know, every, every function has kind of been fulfilled, but um, I kind of removed myself from any function besides the fact that we've been laboring and painting, so we got a few artists over here in the next building doing a bunch of uh, painting of animals and all, but... Um, Besides that, you know, I, I love hanging out with people and getting to know people and talking with people. And so we as the church are the witness, right? You shall be witnesses when the Holy Spirit has filled you. We just finished a series on the Holy Spirit. And so if you want to come and hang out and just be a blessing and communicate with people and as they come and just help wherever you can uh, jump in. But really being here and your presence being here and loving on people as they come in out of the world this crazy year, right? Um, that we can actually just love on them. So we encourage you guys to come out and dress up. There's something weird going on with the sound. Can you guys hear? Ooh. Yeah, it's there. Power. No. <laughs> All right. Anyways, we do have a Christmas message for you um, this morning. And uh, why don't we go ahead and pray, and we'll get into the teaching. Dear Lord, um, bless this time. Bless this season. And Lord, of all people, we need to celebrate and we need to show our worship towards you uh, in outward ways during this season that people may know that you are the reason uh, for the season. And uh, we thank you for coming to earth and uh, the amazing way that you came. And Lord, minister to our hearts. Prepare us, Lord, for trials coming uh, even through Christmas time, Lord, with family members and and others and office parties and different things that, that occur uh, during this time, Lord, that you may just, um, just minister to our hearts that we may be your ambassadors during this time and also just enjoy it all the more as we just learn more and more about you. And so bless this time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're going to kind of go through the Christmas story or the Christmas scenes as it were and so that's the 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 title of the message scenes of christmas and it is a time to worship it's not a time to be angry or to fret or and all that it, it, it is a time of worship and you're going to see various forms of worship uh through uh the stories that we go through and it came up with this message really i, I taught a message kind of like it a few years ago but but really as we're we're gearing up for tuesday and wednesday night we're actually having live little plays vignettes four of them leading to the final classic on your mantle um, nativity scene you know and you've seen the outside you've seen uh, the the set for that and and so um, and so we're sort of following in that order so scene one we're gonna turn to Luke chapter 1 and verse 39 as you turn there Luke 1 verse 39 you need to understand before Mary got pregnant her older relative Elizabeth had a special pregnancy of her own. Now, she wasn't uh, a virgin um, when she had John the Baptist, but she was elderly and likely beyond childbearing age, and she hadn't had a child. But John the Baptist was born six months prior to Jesus. And so we're going to start looking at Luke chapter 1, verse 39, and it reads, Now Mary arose... In those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit then she spoke out with a loud voice and said Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she, or you, Mary, who believed. For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her, you, from the Lord." And so it is interesting as Mary and Elizabeth meet and Mary is with the child of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and Elizabeth has a miraculous birth of her own. And again, that's a completely different story. It's an amazing story because Elizabeth's husband was a priest and he heard directly from God about this child that his wife was to bear. But she says in verse 43, because... She is filled with the Holy Spirit. She actually prophesies. 
And she realizes, wow. And what comes out is prophecy because she says, it was granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me. She recognizes that this baby is her Lord. And that's amazing because we don't often think of babies. Now, babies are our masters, right? (laughs) Because they kind of master and rule our life, but they're not really our lords as it were. And so that the Lord should come to me, and this is very prophetic. And then she says to Mary, and she encourages Mary. In verse 45, it says, Blessed is she who believed. She knows that Mary has heard from the Lord through the angel. And Mary believed it. And you need to understand, when Mary believed, she was blessed. That was the prophecy over her. But understand, it's the same for us today. If you believe, you're blessed. If you believe, you are blessed. And what does blessed mean? You're given favor from God. You are happy in that particular situation. Even in diverse, crazy situations, you are still happy in what you have in the Lord because you have believed upon him. You can be going through great trial. You can be at at, at death's door. But you can still be blessed because you believe in the promises of God. And so again, Mary had already been visited by the angel and she believed and therefore was blessed. And so Elizabeth's response to the glory of God being revealed to her was to bless. And not to curse, but to bless. What a wonderful response of worship on God's behalf is to bless others because you are blessed. And so what a beautiful response in that first scene. Now, let's look at how Mary responded to what Elizabeth said to her. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, verse 47, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he... Who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts, and he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with food or with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Mary's response is nothing short of just pure worship. She says there in her first response, verse 46, My soul magnifies the Lord. She is declaring the greatness of God. Now, I want you to understand, remember that Mary has heard this message from the angel. She's 14 years old, maybe, around there, a young girl in a a real small town where I'm sure gossip abounds. She hears from this angel, even as she's promised to be married to Joseph, two families in the same area. And she hears from this angel, you're going to be pregnant. But I haven't known a man. That's all right. The Holy Spirit is going to be the father of this child. And you're going to be pregnant. Now, she's heard it. Now, we're going to see that Joseph heard it as well. How many people can she share that joy with? Really just with Joseph, right? You can imagine what a blessing it is for Mary to walk in and start talking to her older relative, cousin or aunt, whatever, some type of relative. As she walks in, and and John the Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb, and she starts prophesying over her, and she gets it. And, And she's been wanting to shout from the mountaintops what God is doing and share like crazy, and she can't do it. 
in her home, own hometown, possibly even to her own family members. She can't scream it out. And what is she doing? She is bursting forth with worship of God. Can you imagine? Someone finally gets it. You know how it is. Sometimes you're around a lot of people that don't know the Lord and there's all these negative thoughts and all these negative things and uh, you know, and God doesn't even exist in their mind and you get around Christians like, whoa, now I can barf it out. <laughs> right? And that's an element of worship. Just it, it comes from inside out. It's like Jeremiah. It is in my bones like a fire. I'm weary of holding it, holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I will not hold it in. I have to burst forth the prophecy or the word or the truth of God. And this is what her worship is. She burst, My soul magnifies the Lord. It comes right out of her. And worship is something that does come from our core. Jesus had rebuked the Pharisees because of their whole relationship with God was based on outward things. Remember, they were doers, right? They, they, they followed the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. The law is to draw us close to God, just not to, it's not supposed to make us robots, right? It's to reveal God's glory. They learn to say all the right things, do all the right things, bowing, incense, all this other stuff. Right? And then we see, though, in the, from the prophet Isaiah, that this has always been a problem. Right? That, 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 that people just fall into religion. That's why it's hard. Like, I, I'm okay with liturgy in, in a whole lot of structure as long as it keeps the meaning. But the problem with a whole lot of structure and liturgy is so often we can just fall into the habit of doing it instead of really understanding it and really glorifying God with it. We've done our duty, now we can walk off and live our life. And that's what it's kind of like. I, I paid my tithe, now I can live like hell. Like we pay God off with these particular things, right? And so in Isaiah 29, 13, it says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths, their actions, their traditions, and honor me with their lips, but have removed, they have removed their hearts far from me. And God's looking for the core of who you really are. And, and, and so she bursts out from, from her soul. Oh! And she couldn't wait to do it. And then John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus talking with the woman at the well. You know, and, and, and for me, I, I realize, you know, I, I, I was silver spooned as a Christian, Christian parents, Christian aunts and uncles, Christian grandparents, Christian great grandparents, you know, just kind of that, that world, right? And for me, I'm, I'm a musician and, and sort of, uh, some would disagree with that, but I started off playing the piano a little bit and then eventually was in marching band and learned the bass line on the trombone. And, you know, eventually when I became a Christian, started on the guitar, the bass, drums, just different things, you know, and I, I love music. I, I love to listen to, to um, orchestra music or classical music, uh, you know, puts my brain on fire. I do the night with classical music, drives my family crazy, right? Just <laughs> and... Uh, but I also like, you know, I like harmonies like from the 60s, right? You know, these, w without all the filters and without all the stuff on their voices, like these people are pretty darn talented, you know, and I could listen to different things, but there comes a point when I'm just like, ah, I got to get back to worship. And it doesn't matter how cheesy and simple the worship song is, my heart just wants to worship, right? And, and you want to get back to that place. And if you've ever gone through a time of backsliding, how, how awesome it is for you to step back into that realm of worship in your heart. And so if you, if you truly believe, as Mary, she just wanted to explode out in worship, it starts from the inside. You are truly saved. You are transformed. You are different. You're not just performing differently, and you're not just following a religion, and you're not just bowing in some type of, 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 of pre-laid-out format or plan. It comes from your heart. This is why God gave the gift of tongues, so you can burst forth from your heart without trying to... Can, troll it into some type of format. And so outward things like music and raising your hands or kneeling before God can be important, but they're nothing if it doesn't really come from the heart. And it's funny because you can have worship leaders that are highly talented, but worship kind of doesn't always happen. 
And then you can have a person, you know, with a washboard and worship happens, you know, <laughs> or spoons or something. Because you can tell they're worshiping from the heart. Now, it's great to have both. But, but, but worship, it, it's, it's real. And so she bursts forth in worship. So her response is worship and a desire to worship and a bursting forth in worship. Now, turn with me to scene two. Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verse 18. We'll be flopping back and forth between Matthew and Luke here. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And it reads, now... The birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed or promised to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. He was a good man. He didn't want to make a scene, but he was just going to kind of walk off instead of bring charges against her. Because as an engaged woman, she would have committed adultery had it been, had she become pregnant in the traditional fashion. And the, the wages of that sin and that culture in that day was death. You could be stoned to death. And so he's like, I don't want to, I'm just going to walk away. Verse 20, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So he's contemplating over time, what do I do? Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary for your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save people from their sins. Now Jesus is, is is an interpretation of the Old Testament Hebrew name Joshua or Yahshua which means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. You shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. He would die on a cross, and he would pay for the sins of the world with his own death. Verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So Emmanuel, this is what he will be called. His name is Jesus. He'll be called several things, the Christ and Emmanuel, but Emmanuel means God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. And he did not know her sexually, until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And so he's going to put her away. He hears the revelation of God through the angel Gabriel, and he decides to still take this woman as his wife. Oh, you could imagine the gossip, gossip circles. That would be tough. The easier thing would be put her away, not step into this realm. But what does he do? He hears and he obeys. So his response to revelation, his way of worshiping the Lord is obedience. More about that in a moment. So his name shall be called Emmanuel. God is with us. God is with us. What an incredible name, extra name for Jesus. God is with us. I remember when I was younger, there was a song sung, Oh, God is watching us from a distance. And I said, yeah, right on he is. And very closely. Right? He's, he's very closely watching us. In fact, he became a man and dwelt among us. He's not watching us from a distance. He knows us intimately. John wrote, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's not just from a distance. It's intimate. God is with us, Emmanuel. The word became flesh. It's interesting that word is logos in the Greek. 
And, and logos isn't just a Christian concept, but logos means knowledge, wisdom, even creative force. And, and even someone like Plato, the philosopher, believed that the world was created by logos. He couldn't define what logos was because he wasn't a believer, but he knew something was out there that w was this incredibly knowledgeable force, an incredibly powerful force that created all things. This ancient philosopher obviously recognized there was design in the creation. He couldn't get away from that. And no logical thinking person, unless they convince themselves otherwise, would think it's all random. And he understood that as the Logos. And this is Plato. But we know who the Logos is because the Bible reveals it. He was the Word in the beginning, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, we're all creatures created by God, but Jesus is the only born of God, as it were. Adam was created by God. Jesus was born of God. He's a chip off the old block. Therefore, he says in John chapter 14, verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And so this revelation is brought to Joseph. He is of the Father. This child you're going to raise is God in the flesh. Joseph's response, obedience. His way of worshiping at the response of God is obedience. And unfortunately, this is something that, that isn't really thought about too much today. It's like, I'm going to receive the, the benefits of salvation. I'm just going to live, live the way I want to live. And so, you know, I'll have my spirit saved, but, but my flesh is just going to run rampant. Instead of, how can I return back to God? And, and unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians out there they kind of get halfway there in the sense of they, they receive Jesus' as salvation, but, but, but the flesh takes over, and they never experience the joy of obedience. So we've been preparing for this outreach, and, and it's just been long days. And we've had you know, 20, 30 people here at, at given times and random times, and we got actors, we got set builders, we got people working on the electronics, sound systems, and you know, we, we've gathered a few of us artists in there to, to make the animals. And so we've been working on this for two or three days, you know, cutting out these animals and painting them for six, eight hours, you know, and just tired by the end of the day. And they're all saying, what a blessing it is to serve the Lord. It's so, tired. It's, it's, it's so good to be tired for the Lord, for the right thing, and, and, and to, to lay your head on. What a blessing. And unfortunately, people don't understand how blessed it is to sacrifice for the Lord. You can never outgive him. But what a joy it is to serve the Lord to the point of being tired and, and, and to give and to obey and to, to, to give back. You know, you come into this incredible promise. What, what are you going to do? And, and, and as you mature, there, there's a point in time when it's like, what can I give back? What else can I do to give back to the Lord for this incredible blessing that he's given us? It is a beautiful thing to worship with obedience. And we need to encourage everybody around us to study the beauty of that and the reward of being sacrificial unto the Lord. And so his main response is, okay against what the culture is saying, against what my family is saying, against what people might think, I am going to choose the hard way and be obedient to God rather than to man and man's opinion. In his response, his worship unto the Lord, into the revelation of Jesus Christ, is obedience. Now let's look at scene three back in Luke chapter two. If you would turn there, Luke chapter two. Starting at verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, teaching, te 
keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So in verse 11, we see another title. It is Christ. It means Messiah in the Greek, but it really means the anointed one from the Old Testament. One whom God has specially anointed for a specific purpose, and that would be Jesus. He is not a Christ. He is the Christ, the one that they were waiting for. It was a title of the Jewish Savior, the one who would rescue the Jew from their enemies. And he is lying in a manger and visited by shepherds. Now, a manger, it is interesting. When you go to Israel, we always see these mangers, you know, and the lighting's all perfect and they're made out of wood. But what are mangers? Mangers are feeding troughs for animals. That's what mangers are. And very often in Israel, they were made out of stone instead of wood. And you can go to Israel today and they've dug up mangers. <laughs> what is that? Well, it's a manger. And it's not the prettiest thing. It's covered in slop. You know, every so often I do got to pick up my dog bowls and wash them out because there's all kinds of grime stuck on that, right? And he was born in a manger and visited by shepherds. Now, understand shepherds were on the lowest rung of the social ladder. We, we kind of glorify shepherds, don't we? But shepherds were the ones that they didn't want around. And this is the amazing story of David, right? Because David was the younger brother out of all these brothers, and David was sent out into the field because they didn't want him around. And so God used David in an incredible way, the greatest king that Israel ever had because he was the most spiritual king that Israel ever had. And so the, the ones that you, you push out, like, get out of here, go take care of those animals, go away for a few weeks, right? And, and in this day and time, they were known to be questionable people, dirty people, and even thieves. You didn't want them in your neighborhood, <laughs> you know? So if they were leading their flocks through your town, you'd be like, hey, watch out for my stuff. They were thought of as troublemakers. And the amazing thing is, this is who God chose to reach out to. And many of you might think, well, I'm not much. But you're just as valuable as anybody else in God's eyes. And, and so often he proves that. What? Well, Mary, 14-year-old girl from Nazareth, little town with a bad reputation. He chooses her to be the mother of his child. Right? And, and, and then you have the first pronouncement to shepherds. These guys that are scary to a lot of people. But the angel comes and tells them, Jesus is lying in a manger. Shepherds probably couldn't get any, in any other place rather than a corral, <laughs> right? Oh no, here they come. But the Lord wants to reach everybody. It's everybody. No one is, is too bad for the Lord to desire to reach. In fact, Paul tells the Corinthians, not many of you were noble, not many of you were wise, not many of you were of high report when you were called. And he goes on to say, God uses the things that are not, the things that are foolish, and the things uh, that are not praiseworthy, what, to, to shame those, to, to glorify himself in that those that think they're something are going to be overwhelmed by those that are nothing because of the glory of God. This is why he used fishermen 
To shame who? Well, to shame the religious elite, right? And they noted that they had been with Jesus. And tax collectors and insurrectionists. And so these shepherds, where would they find him? In a manger. And what did these angels say? Glory to God in the highest. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Glory in the highest to God. Glory is doxa. They respond to the revelation God gave them with doxa, with glory. There's no one whom the universe has a higher opinion of than God. And who should know this? The angels, right? They were created directly by God. They're in his presence. They can see his glory. And you know what? They're amazed at what God did still. They're amazed that God would like, God to a human? It's crazy. The glory to God in the highest. They get to experience it real time and see God's plan fulfilled and they are crying out, doxa, glory. The angel's response is glory to the revelation of God. Verse 15 goes on in Luke 2 and it says, So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying that was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and poured or pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told him. Glorifying and praising God. The first evangelists tell the world about Jesus. They were lowly, scuzzy shepherds. (laughs) The angels worshipped. That was glorious, but who else worshipped? The shepherds. And in God's Understanding, he was blessed by the worship of angels and blessed by the worship of shepherds. You're not too bad or dumb or lowly for God. Now, after the birth of Jesus, it's understood that Joseph and Mary stayed in Bethlehem for at least a couple of years. They didn't keep living in the manger, but at some point, they found a house to live in, as we're going to see in our next scene. You can turn to Matthew chapter 2. But the shepherd's response was praise, worship, and witness. They couldn't hold it in. They had to share with everybody what they had seen. So scene four, Matthew chapter two, verse one. And it says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in, those day, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. We have seen his star. This is amazing that they knew about a star that would announce the coming of the Messiah. Now, it is rooted in an old prophecy, but it's an obscure prophecy. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in Numbers chapter 24, In verse 16, there's a prophecy given by a very rebellious prophet. Now, as the Jews were coming into the land in the Exodus and all, there was this king named uh, Balak, and he hired this prophet to give a curse upon the people, and he could not curse them. All he could do was prophesy blessing on him, on them. And so this is his prophetic Blessing upon the people. Balaam, the rebellious, gives a really good prophecy. It says, The utterance of him who hears the words of God and has knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Jacob and Israel are the same. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So a star is going to come 
and a scepter, which means a ruler will rise out of Israel. And he will batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. And so he's going to rule and he's going to reign and he's going to be the ultimate king. And so a star is mentioned here. Now, I do have a hypothesis. You guys have probably heard this <laughs> before. But you remember back when Daniel was taken to Babylon. And as Daniel was taken to Babylon, the Lord raised him up to be one of these wise men. He was, in fact, the leader of the wise men. Words that he spoke would be recorded. Now, we know that Daniel most likely prophesied way beyond in those, in those 70 years or so that he prophesied in Babylon. But, so he served under Nebuchadnezzar. He served under Darius, Belteshazzar. He served under uh, these guys and probably more. But he was the leader. He was the sensei. He was the one above all these wise men. And these men were mostly astrologers. And so I can imagine him looking back at the prophecy and explaining to these men, and the, the writings and the understanding and the respect that Daniel had would have been carried down through the ages. These men see a star, they're going, that reminds me of something from the old prophet Daniel from 500 years prior to this. That he said there would be a star. And he's, he explained it to them, I believe. And this caused them to pack up, to prepare, to get ready, to gather gifts, and to have this big old entourage. Right? How many wise men were there? Well, we three kings of Orient are. Well, well, it's not necessarily that way. Three types of gifts are mentioned. There could have been more gifts, but three types are mentioned. And there could have been you know, ten wise men. There could have been two. <laughs> there was multiple wise men, but, but, because it says wise men, not wise man. But we don't know how many there were, okay? But they bring three different types of gifts. But God speaks to their heart and causes them to invest great effort, two years of planning, an entourage, gifts, and everything else through hostile territory to go all the way in to see the Son of God, the Messiah, the King, the one that would bring peace. But let's look at verse 3 there in Matthew 2. It says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. He was a paranoid man. And it is interesting to see people in power be paranoid when they don't know the Lord, because they're not secure. You think about someone like Nebuchadnezzar. Should he have been secure? He should have been secure, right? But, but what does he do? You, you see the Lord progressively in the book of Daniel start to minister to him start to awaken his eyes to spiritual things beyond what he understands. But, but we know at, at a point in time, he should be secure, but what does he do? He built a 90-foot high t statue, chapter 3, right? Tells everybody to worship you, worship it, or I'm going to kill you. Now, what kind of worship is that? Right? If you're forcing people to worship you, what, what kind of satisfaction is that? But such an insecure man that he has to build a 90-foot statue and force people to worship him, or else he's going to kill them. Right? But we know chapter 4 comes along and God ultimately humbles this great man to worship before the king of kings, not to get people to worship him. And so he's this extremely insecure man. Well, Herod is very much the same way. Herod is known as Herod the Great or Herod the Builder. And he built all kinds of things to try to prove his worth, but he still eventually died, right? He still eventually died. He was threatened by this. Understand this. Worldly men are always threatened by heavenly things. Worldly men are always threatened by heavenly things. And when I share with people, and they, they vehemently oppose what I'm saying if I'm talking about the Lord, they're threatened by my Lord. They're not threatened by me. They're threatened by my Lord. That's why they fight against it. Now, if I walk up to someone and I start talking about unicorns, they're going to look at me like, you're an idiot, and just walk away. They're not going to be threatened by anything. But the fact of the matter is, there's eternity planted in their heart, and they're threatened by a true and living God, which they know must exist somewhere deep down in who they are. And they're threatened by it. And listen, worldly men are threatened by heavenly things. Listen, we've got a lot of people in politics right now that are threatened by heavenly things. 
We got a lot of people in universities right now that are threatened by heavenly things. We have a lot of people steeped in a lot of very deep bad sin and they are threatened by heavenly things. And why are they threatened? Because somewhere deep down inside them, they know it's real. And I just trust that. Now, I don't want to be rejected because I'm being a jerk, but if I'm rejected for the truth, you know what? God's still doing something there. So Herod is freaking out, right? Herod's response, this is the only bad response we're looking at, is fear and loathing at the revelation of the king. Fear and loathing. You don't want to be that one. (laughs) And then verse 4 goes on. It says, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ, the Messiah, was to be born. And so they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, it's interesting, he doesn't want to believe what the whole of Scripture says, but he believes what this part of Scripture says, right? And so the prophet Micah told us the birthplace of Messiah, 700 years prior to his birth. Verse 7, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star had appeared, approximately two years prior. Verse 8, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring him bring back word to me that I might worship him also. Liar. <laughs> when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with, his, with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, these guys were top in government. These guys were uh, the wisest. Did I just lose battery power? No, I still got two bars. Something happened. Can you guys still hear me? Huh? We lost some mains. Just tilt it, yeah. Dave will fix it. <laughs> Is it not coming out of there? It's coming out of somewhere, right? Somewhere. Okay. Let's, let's continue on. <laughs> they fell down. It would be one thing for shepherds to fall down. You'd expect that. But it is such an incredible thing when these men fall down, when they humble themselves. But everybody has to humble themselves before the Lord, don't they? It doesn't matter who you are. You have to eventually humble yourself. The problem with those that are wise and those that are something in this world, it's just harder to do so. That's why it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven because he's relying on his riches and it's hard to humble yourself when you've got something else to hold on to and your pride doesn't let you do it. So worship requires recognizing that God is much greater, better, and bigger than you are. Worship involves yielding to God, surrendering to God, and falling down before God. It is a significant step in maturity in this life to learn what healthy humility is all about. Now remember, these wise men are falling down in front of a toddler. That's wild, right? He's a toddler, but they're recognizing the truth of what, is God, what God is doing. But they submitted, they surrendered, they fell down before the incarnation of God in the flesh, this little toddler boy. First Peter five, or first, yeah, First Peter five five. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Humility is so important. It is so important. 
It, it is just key to everything. And, and if you don't submit or humble yourself before God, you're always wrestling against God. And that is tiring. I, I always surf here on the north side of Packery Channel. It's a normal place that I surf. And it's interesting because even though the waves aren't always huge, I mean, sometimes they get fairly large, but there's, there's weird currents there, right? And, and so sometimes, and I was a champion swimmer as a kid, played water polo and, and then uh, did triathlons and have surfed my whole life. But every so often I get caught in this current. Once I get away from the jetty, I get caught in this current. And this current's going in. And I'll be paddling. There'll be no waves hitting me. And I, I'm going backwards. And I am paddling hard. And it is so frustrating. So finally what I do is I turn around. I just ride a wave in. And then I walk next to the jetty. And then I get on the Jesus train. <laughs> you know, and I, I jump into the water. And there's always a, a riptide going out next to the jetty. And so I, you know what I do? I don't even paddle. I just sit there on my board. Dee, 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 dee. And I let the work happen for me. And the thing is, if I'm going to be prideful, I'm going to be fighting against God, and I cannot win that fight. I'm going to exhaust myself and keep on going backwards. But when I humble myself, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And I step into the middle of God, and he is the one that lifts me up and that exalts me. Humility is radically important for Christian maturity. And they worshiped him. They expressed adoration, love, and affection towards God, and they gave back to God. They presented gifts. Gold, the proper gift for a king. Frankincense was incense that priests used. And Jesus Christ was a priest in the line of Melchizedek. But it's interesting, myrrh was also given and mentioned here. And, and myrrh is a, is a, is a resin type of, of, uh, of spice. It's, it's strong smelling. And what they would do is they would embalm people with it. Interesting, right? And very prophetic. But also, these things were very expensive. And remember, just right after this, Herod sent people in to kill the children. So they had to escape where? To Egypt. How did they pay for that? Joseph, being a mere carpenter. Eh, God provided. He tends to do that, right? And so worship includes giving back to the Lord. We give back to him. And it's not all about money, time, talents, training, trinkets, all to bring praise and honor and glory to God. And so the wise men's response was seeking, finding, giving, falling, and adoring God. And so we've looked at all these responses to the revelation of God. But what about worship music? Yeah, does worship music count? Certainly it does, as long as it's from the heart. But you know what else counts as worship? Everything else. Our whole lives, we don't leave and now we suspend our Christianity until the next week or the next time we're around. Praise God, brother. It's full time. But God wants your substance. He wants who you are. He doesn't want just outward actions. He wants it to start with the heart and what he's done in your life. So what is your response this Christmas? Is it blessing, like Elizabeth? Is it worship, just straight out, like Mary? Is it obedience, like Joseph? Is it doxa or glory? You, you just phrase it out and light in this dark world. The shepherd's response, praise, worship, and what? Evangelism, sharing. King Herod's response, fear and loathing, don't want to do that, right? And the wise men's response, seeking, giving, adoring, bowing down, and worshiping the Lord. The world seems to have stole Christmas, but it really can't ever do that, can it? It is a time for us to commemorate the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It didn't happen on December 25th. It most likely happened in the spring because you didn't take animals to go chew on snow. Right? The shepherds were out in green grass somewhere, most likely the spring in Israel. Right? It's okay. Is God okay with us celebrating? How many festivals did God commemorate in the Old Testament? Bunch, right? Seven to nine. Is he about celebration? And as much as the world tries to rip you off, it's okay, guys. You don't need to be ripped off by the world. 
It's the revelation of God's plan being initiated in this world, and we can celebrate it all we want. Na 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 na. But make sure it includes deep, heartfelt worship during this season. And so at this point, we go from the birth of Jesus to the death of Jesus and his resurrection. We're going to celebrate in communion this morning. Now, what, what is the Lord's Supper? What is a, the Lord's gift? Well, the Lord on the night he was betrayed, before he went to the cross, he, he gave this, this upper room discourse with the, the disciples, and he's like trying to pour everything out on them all at once, like, oh, here it comes, man. Many chapters of John are dedicated to this. But during that time, he says, in knowing they're not going to get it until later, he picks up a piece of the, the, uh, the bread, the matzah, which is normally poked with holes and striated with burns, stripes and piercings. And he holds it up and he breaks it. And he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Now he's found that interesting because we know it's the blood that redeems us. Why does he take the bread and break it? He says, this is my body. I was punished. It isn't just the redeeming of the life, but it's the punishment on top of that. I was punished. I was broken. I was willing to go through this for you. And it's weird because for us, you know, if we know we're going to stub our toe if we walk over there, how many of us are actually going to walk over there? Right? We're not going to do it. We don't like pain. A little stub toe, no, I ain't walking over there if I know it's going to happen. But we are told, for the joy that was laid before him, he endured the cross. He saw your face. He knew, and it was his plan, the level of punishment that he would take. And now he has stepped into human flesh, and he knows exactly what's coming. Even in the garden, he's saying, not my will, but your will be done. Because he wanted it not to happen, but he still chose to walk over there. He chose to walk through the beatings, the mockings, the spitting on, the crown on, 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 his, on his head, you know, the beating, the, the, the slapping. Guess who, guess who hit you and, and the ripping out of his beard, the stretched over, over a rock and his back being opened by a whip, just pulling flesh off of his back, and most men didn't even survive that part of it. And then... You know, his body was broken. He took that punishment for us. And we're to remember that. It was his choice to do it for the joy that was set before him. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us the same thing. He will see and be satisfied at the result of his punishment, basically, is what it means. He will see and be satisfied that you got saved. He looked forward and saw your face and that you would be saved, that you would respond. And we're to remember that great love and that great sacrifice for him by the breaking of the bread. And then the pouring out of the blood. Eventually, his, he was pierced in the side and, and blood mixed with something that looked like water. And we understand that now medically to be his cardiac sac being filled with, um, with fluid out of his blood as his heart strained and his blood got thicker in his veins. And he really died of a broken heart ultimately. And, and, and that blood was shed. But from the very beginning, from the first sin, there was an animal sacrifice. And what does blood represent? Blood represents life. His life, not just the punishment of the body, but his life. We do not live without blood. The other day in Maui, I was watching a surf contest and uh, a live broadcast, but the next day they were supposed to have the, the surf contest again in Maui, a place I surfed a bunch. And someone got bit by a shark. And they died. Why? They bled out. They, they, they lost too much blood. Life is in our blood. And God has always told us, respect the blood. What? It represents life. And he took the cup and he said, this cup is, my, is, is the life. My life blood. And this, this life is given for you. And then he says, do this in remembrance of me. This doesn't become the body and become the blood of Jesus Christ. It represents the body and represents what he did. This is not a sacrament that saves you. This reminds you of the great sacrifice, the great thing that actually makes you holy, which is the sacrament that saves us. Nothing else saves us. It's the blood of Jesus. 
and we're to remember that. What a great time to remember that as we enter into Easter week. As many of you enter into pressure cookers of family and other things going on at work and craziness and chaos, right? <laughs> and busyness and having to buy last minute gifts and so on and so forth, you know. My gift to my wife was, you don't have to buy me a gift. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't have to look for the things that, you know, these types of things. But, you know, it's chaos. But we need to remember, we're full-time Christians, right? And you're saved in the supermarket just as much as you're saved in Walmart, just as much as you're saved anywhere else. You're saved at visiting family for the holidays. And so this is what it reminds us to do. So let his glory go before you. And respond well, blessing, obedience, glory, praise, and worship, and seeking, giving, adoring, witnessing, sharing about who the Lord is. What we're going to do is we're going to invite the worship team to come on up, and uh, we're going to pray in a minute. But the process is going to be this. We're going to worship for a time, and as we're worshiping, um, you can come forward and receive the elements, and you can go ahead and take them on your time whenever you want to take them. And uh, you don't have to wait for us uh, to take them all together, but you can take them and you can spend some time praying before the Lord with the elements and you can take it with uh, uh, those that are around you or how, however you want to do that. But uh, when your heart is ready, just come and, and take of it and just make sure you take of it in a worthy ma manner. What is worthy? Remembering what he has done for you. And that's, what, that's, that's a worthy way to take it. And uh, I do encourage you, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, um, if you take this, it doesn't really do anything, right? But if you're sitting there right now and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you want to know Jesus, I know he's been working on your heart a long time if that is you. This is how he works. His spirit works on you your whole life. But if you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today I would ask you, just say, Lord, I need you. I need a Savior. I need you. And, and, and he knows what to do at that point. And then you're free to come up and you're just as worthy at that moment to receive of the elements as anybody else in this room because he saved all of us completely. None of us can get there on our own. And so I want to encourage you, if that is you, let us know. We've had many people over the years give their heart to the Lord over communion and, and what, a, what a blessing it is. And so I'd encourage you to do that also. But please let us know afterwards if that is you. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll celebrate in communion this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you for the season. We thank you for the remembrance of your birth, Lord. Lord, even if people are spiteful, mean, evil, disrespectful, Lord, may we return evil with good. Fill our hearts with the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, and help us to surrender, to let it out during this season, God. May it truly be all about you, Lord. And we know it's better to give than to receive, Lord. And even as we give gifts, Lord, Lord, you are a generous God, and we can never outgive you. And may we just be generous in this season. Lord, even as we uh, close up this morning, I do pray for Tuesday, and I pray for Wednesday, and I pray that people might be introduced to you, uh, to the love of your family, and that you might draw them into the kingdom that new life would come because of the efforts of your saints here, that we may be awesome witnesses unto your glory, unto your salvation, unto your eternity, unto your joy, your fulfillment, Lord. And so, Lord, do a work, we pray, Tuesday and Wednesday evening. We come together Thursday, Lord. We ask that you bless that time as well as, as the family of the church, God. Lord, we love you. May you remain the center of this season, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
check one, two. Hey. Thank you. 